Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever people are. Thank you so much for joining us. You have come to the Women's Leadership on Climate Change, Coastal Ecology and Native Wisdom uh, Zoom webinar. We are obviously part of the CSW 66. This is a parallel event to the Commission on the Status of Women. And we are proud of the NGO CSW for their efforts to bring the voices of women from all over the world and all over civil society to put appropriate pressure on the proceedings inside the uh, UN halls working on this year's declaration from the Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, we have here today a set of fantastic speakers and I'm going to be sharing the moderating of this with Jamie Bissonette Louie. Before I introduce her, I want to uh, say thanks to our sponsors. They include the United Religions, Religions Initiative. They have concentric circles around the globe, pushing for values-based interfaith action. Um, Green Faith is another co-sponsor of this event, and they, again, are working internationally, mostly towards eco-justice efforts in a very urgent fashion. Bioneers is also a co-sponsor of this event. They do very much great work lifting up Native people's voices on the most critical issues of our day. So I recommend you check out their website. And last but not least, thank you very much to our colleagues at the UN Committee on the Rights of Indigenous People. Now, again, I would like to introduce Jamie Bissonette Louie, and she is the Director of a Healing and Transformation Center in Maine. And I wanna thank her so much for partnering with me on the strategy of this session to make sure that we are hearing from Native peoples about perspectives that are not about a dominant perspective about information gathering, et cetera. So we are waiting now for our first speaker who is Teresa Dardar. And uh, she is the president of the Lowlander Center. Um, she's a member of the Point O'Shane Indian tribe and she will speak to the vulnerability of her small community in La Forche Parish, Louisiana, where it's an extremely fragile coastal area and it has suffered from the extractive practices of the oil industry, mostly that built canals and have left 27,000 of them unfilled where they have increased the damage and the erosion that's happening there. She is the president and her full bio is available on the Lowlander website. She is an engaged activist in so many arenas that I'll ask you to read them there and I will be welcoming her as soon as we can get her on the line. We will be then following with marine scientist Robin Hadlock Seeley of Maine. She will be speaking on her decades of scientific work on local seaweed, including study of the safe limits to harvesting rather than the proposed extractive removal under the guise of climate adaptation and mitigation. She will also report on actions to stop a silver mine that is poised to endanger the coast. And following her, we will hear from Dr. Ricky Ott. She is a marine toxicologist and former Alaska a commercial fisherman. She founded her, found her path and her voice during the transformative crucible of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Accomplished in civic activism and grassroots engagement, she inspires youth and adults with accessible science and civics-based trainings and with stories to engage people in working together towards a healthy democracy and a healthy energy future. She currently directs two projects through the Earth Island Institute, the Alert Project and Ultimate Civics. You will find the links that we discussed during this session, we will have on the Temple of Understanding webpage for this event. So you don't need to take too many notes. Um, we will be putting that into the chat as soon as we can and um, at this point, can I turn it over to you, Jamie, if you'd care to make some introductory remarks? And then I believe that we will have President Teresa Dardar um, available shortly. Chiwilimani, Gro, Nil Tiliwisi, Pemusid Muin, Nil Giwanig, Plomiel, Nil Abiniki. I'm Jamie Bissonette Louis. I'm accompanied by my granddaughter, who I'm 
honored to be caring for for this little part of the, her early life. And my participation is circumscribed by Danny's needs. So if I exit, um, Grove and I have prepared uh, a kind of a shared moderation, uh, a give and take. And so, um, but Danny's sleeping right now. Before we started, I wanted to kind of give, I believe that most of the truths of our culture is held in our language. And so I always believe if I can't talk about it in my own language, maybe I shouldn't be talking about it. And so um, I, I wanted to say one thing about the way we speak about water um, and earth in Algonquian languages. And Teresa, if she gets in, she might have a different perspective from her language because hers is in a different, a different language family. But in Algonquian languages, we have what we call an M marker that goes on the end of words connected to the earth and water gets this marker because it's connected to the earth. When water's in a cup, it doesn't have this marker, doesn't have the M marker. And the M marker, it's one little, one little letter, there's Teresa, um, one little letter on the end of a word, um, like river, nasibum, it will get the M. And it means that that water, that body of water that is a part of me, and I am a part of it, and Without me, it does not exist. And without it, I do not exist. And so I'd like to just offer that as we talk about um, our rivers and streams, particularly our rivers and streams that are entering into the ocean uh, in the intertidal zone. Um, Robin Hadlock Seeley has spent years uh, protecting the seaweed forests that blanket um, the North Atlantic coast. And I know the same thing goes on the North Pacific coast. Um, and these forests are 500 years old. So they uh, knew us before we were visited by the others. And we knew them before anyone else was here but us. And so in those forests, a lot of our memory, a lot of our shared DNA exists. And it's really painful to see them um, harvested and turned into fertilizer. The only place where you can really find pristine um, seaweed forests here is on uh, the coast that follows the Passamaquoddy Reservation at Sabaye because they don't allow cutting. And the rockweed is 12 feet long and you can raft on it in your canoe at high tide and feel that um, strength of shared place. So I just say that to frame this and then I'd like to turn it over to Teresa. What I had wanted to do is to have Teresa frame uh, what is happening in her community and then hear from Robin and Nikki, who are uh, scientists who've been accompanying indigenous people in their protective practices in uh, really amazing and wonderful ways. So maybe what we should do is jump forward to Robin and then if when Teresa comes on, jump back to her. Good morning, everyone. So it's really great to be here at this event and to talk to you about some of the seaweed forests um, that I've been working on protecting um, for a couple of decades now. I'm also Jamie's neighbor, so I have the great privilege of living across from her, and we've been talking about this together uh, for a while, so it's really great to bring this to, your, to this audience. So I'm going to be talking about um, efforts to prot protect Maine's underwater seaweed forest. So these seaweed forests, um, which you may or may not have heard of, um, are on the coast of Maine. 
they're a forest in that they're long lived in the same sense that um, another forest that you might know better are the California uh, giant kelp forests. Um, they're better known, um, but these rockweed forests that live in the intertidal along the Northwest Atlantic um, in Maine um, perform the same functions by providing three dimensional habitat structure underwater for about 150 different species. And one of the functions of the of the underwater forest is that we have fish um, do feed have feeding and sheltering habitat at high tide. And at low tide, um, feeding habitat for a lot of vulnerable bird species, including shorebirds, ducks, herons, and seabirds. The challenge is um, to get government and others who should be playing a role in the protection of this habitat see it as a wild ecosystem, an integrated whole, and not an isolated individual commodity priced at about five cents a pound shipped around the world for agricultural use. So thank you very much for your attention and learning about the rockweed seaweed forest of Maine. And that concludes my short presentation. Just before we, we go on, I just, um, I just want to remind, you know, all of everyone here to kind of make a shift in your mind. Because uh, we think of habitat, we think of location, we think of map. But from our perspective as Indigenous people, this land is our relative. Uh, we are talking about a living, a living being that we've been in relationship with for since the beginning, since um, we came out of these these spaces, and so the the loss um, and harm and changes is is really really intimate. And I think if we can challenge ourselves to think from that perspective, I think we can shift our perspective on why it's so important. Um, and for many of um, many of the tribes who, like Teresa's, whose land is along the coast, mm -hmm. we're looking at a a forced removal um, that's a direct result of the actions of human beings. And so um, one of the pieces about being about indigeneity is that it's land-based. And when our land disappears, there's, there are profound changes. And so I just add, we'll ask you to think about that while we wait for Teresa and I'll turn this over to Nikki, who's been working with the Pacific Northwest tribes. Um, thank you. That was very beautiful, Jamie, and very um, grounding. So thank you for that. And thank you for this invite to participate with you all today as well. Um, I'd um, actually like to start by 
um, dedicating uh, this story to my mother who passed away on the 14th memorial of the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill. She forever transformed March 24th, the day the water died, into a day of being closely held by her love and by the love of our communities as we work to transform this disaster. One year after the spill, Exxon declared wildlife were recovering. Fishermen and native people knew that it would be at least four years before the full ecosystem impacts uh, would be known. Four years measured in the life cycles of pink salmon and the four year growth rate of young herring into adults. In 1993, four years after the spill, the herring and pink salmon runs failed and the Prince William ecosystem collapsed. Fishermen and native peoples blockaded Valdez Narrows to hold up tanker traffic, oil tanker traffic. After three days, President Clinton pledged to fulfill the fishermen's demand for comprehensive ecosystem studies to understand the oil spill impact and the blockade peacefully disbanded. When I say fishermen, I am including native peoples. That fall, fishermen demanded that scientists work with them in a transparent public process to design a comprehensive study of salmon and herring. That process was open to the community. It took all winter, six months, as people had to learn how to listen to understand each other. The collaboration called the Sound Ecosystem Assessment Project or C program resulted in a new healthy respect among fishermen and scientists, a new holistic understanding of ecosystem function and food web interactions and better fisheries management tools. And when I say new here, it was new to the scientists, okay? Um, I don't think it was so new to the native peoples at all or the fishermen. But the scientists were still publishing silo papers about birds, fish, marine mammals, coastal habitat. I received a small grant to have the scientists merge their findings into one story. This collaboration led to a paradigm shift, a new understanding of ecosystem response and recovery in ecosystem time to uh, injury. And in this case, the injury is the oil spill. These stories are shared in my book, Sound Truth and Corporate Myths, which is free um, and in a digital form online. Meanwhile, the local fisheries-based economy faltered when the fisheries collapsed uh, in 1993. The town was an absolute cauldron of fear, depression, suicides, fighting. Without fish bucks, what would drive the economy? Ideas for clear cutting, strip mining, building roads for industrial tourism only gave us more things to fight about. Four of us, including EAC native Dune Lankert, hatched an idea to diversify the economy by getting people to rebuild trust in each other first. We asked seven community leaders who reflected the diversity of opinions in town. In other words, they were all fighting each other to sign a letter inviting people to a public workshop. 400 people showed up in a town of 2000. The Copper River Watershed Project grew out of that first meeting because people were ready for change. If it was community driven in design and action. Process was critical. Alaska native leadership was key. Native leaders facilitated our public meetings. The first board members were four native people from upriver and downriver, Chugach and Iak, and interior natives, the Athabascan. The clear cutting was driven by for profit native corporations with white leadership. We invited Menominee from Wisconsin to share stories with EAC and Chugach people of how the Menominee have managed their successful sustainable forestry programs for over 150 years. The forest still 
sustains their traditional way of life on the reservation. Plans to clear cut the Copper River Delta stop. The Copper River Watershed Project now has partners with local watershed businesses, state and federal entities, tribes. It has legacy education programs in the school district and it hosts annual hands-on citizen science field projects with youth and adults. It provides a safe and trusted forum for people to continue to work together to maintain an intact ecosystem that sustains our communities. This story of understanding community response to injury from a man-made disaster and community recovery in generational time is shared in my book, Not One Drop. In 2010, when the BP well blew in the Gulf of Mexico and started spewing oil, I had to overcome my own PTSD before I could be of service in these coastal communities. Once I realized that everyone there was going to make the same mistakes we had made in Alaska dealing with Exxon, I bought a one-way ticket to Louisiana. The trust walk lasted one year. My Aleut mentor later told me it was the work of soul retrieval. I witnessed the same disease outbreak of cold and flu-like symptoms in four states simultaneously during the BP response that I had witnessed during the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Sadly, I knew how this story would unfold. The Valdez crud, the BP syndrome, the initial warning symptoms. I, I think it would be the most helpful to hear from Teresa now and then um, loop back to you um, afterwards. Teresa, welcome. So glad to have you here. I was saying before that um, you are doing unbelievable work as the president of the Lowlander Center and that you are a spokesperson, a member of the Pointe O'Shane Indian tribe in an extremely vulnerable community that has suffered greatly from the extractive practices that have left 27,000 unused canals that were just cut for transportation convenience with no respect to the natural environment. And that you and your community are working to try and find a way to actually fill in those as a sensible, affordable bioremediation process that I believe would cost less than one um, bomb fighting plane that the US purchases plenty of. And your full bio is on the Lowlander Center website and you have a list of hats that you wear. I won't rehearse them all now, but just to tell you that we are very honored that you're taking the time to, to join us. And I'm just so grateful that we were able to persist and get you into this call. So thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, it's good to finally be here. And yes, you are correct that um, the, the searching for oil began in early, very early 1900s. Um, one place that I, I did a little research that I found that uh, the first gas uh, well was started at the end of Terrebonne Bayou, which is in Montague, and he found natural gas. And then from that time on, then, you know, the big oil companies came in and they started cutting holes, cutting, not holes, canals. And at first, they, they did refill some at the very beginning because that was what they were supposed to do. But uh, Louisiana does not police that. It doesn't enforce it. So we have all these canals. We have over 35,000 canals, which, like you said, 27 are unused. And um, it helps bring in, well, it, brought in this salt water, which we hear in the, where I live in the Pontichamp Bayou is where people used to get water to wash clothes and everything because it was clean water and they could do, you know, it wasn't as big as it is now, not as wide, but that's where they could get clean water because it was fresh water to wash clothes, just like you see in the movies on the late Westerns, you know, where you see people washing 
their clothes in the, you know, uh, in the bayous or streams. And um, that's how it was down here. And we also had uh, wells for water. Like where our first community was, it, you have to go by boat. It's what we call Ambat La Pointe. In English, it's just Lower Ponishan. You have to go there by boat. But that's where the biggest community was. And everybody had their own well, their own gardens and everything. And, you know, even though you had a storm and you had water, you didn't have as much salt water coming in because you didn't have all these canals back whenever my grandfather was a young boy and all. But then after the oil companies came in, you know, more salt water started coming in and started killing all the vegetation, which, you know, kills, once you kill the vegetation, that's land loss. So we have a lot of that going on. And then we had the BP oil spill in 2010, which that didn't help because it killed a lot of the vegetation there and more land loss and climate change, sea level rise. It's all, you know, hurting the community. We have very little land left now. If you look at the map, yeah, I, well, you can't really tell by the map. You have to have an actual, you know, in-person look at it. Because after Hurricane Ida, I was on a meeting. I went to a meeting with one of the state representatives. Um, and he was saying that uh, a group of uh, politicians went up in a helicopter after Ida. And they said, oh, it doesn't look that bad. It wasn't until they got into their vehicles and actually saw, because see, we're surrounded by water. There's so much water, uh, you know, around us that when you up in the air, well, you know, it looks like it's just water. And, but we, the Ida was not a water event. It was a, a wind event. So anyway, he said when they took a drive, they saw the devastation. And our community was hit the hardest because Ida came in right into the Bayou Ponishan is the line for the Terrebonne, the Fouche parishes. And that's where Ida came in. And the news people kept saying, you know, that it would come in on Terrebonne, the Fouche line. And we knew that that was going to be bad because, you know, that's in, right in our community. So, but thank God everybody left. Some had to be told by the police, you know, the sheriff that they had to leave. But anyway, the water now is like in the back of our house where we have a levee now and they built the Morganza to the girl, uh, which is only 12 feet high. So a uh, storm like Katrina, that would not, be uh, you know high enough and in the back of our house there's water where there used to be land you trapping used to be done there now they're using a different kind of trap instead of a neutral muskrat trap they're using crab traps to catch crab because the water is that much we have that much water now and it's deep enough so we're surrounded by water. The oil companies have canals all around us. And in fact, they're putting an oil rig not far from my house uh, right now on the Terrebonne Parish side. And they haven't put it yet. And we tried to protest that by writing letters and saying it was going to be a nuisance you know, to our community, but they, you know, it's just a small community of American Indians, you know, who cares? So anyway, we, uh, we still fighting to get our canals filled. In fact, I spoke to Representative Tana McGee uh, 
I forget when we had the meeting. I think it was Monday we had the meeting with him. And anyway, um, I spoke to him about the back failing and he asked me what would one canal cost? I said, well, I don't know, you know, but I could find out. But to fill all the canals, it would be, let's see, 35, 300, I think it's 335 thousand dollars million dollars 335 million dollars the price of a single fighter so you know they could do it instead of building putting the money in the diversion which will if they do this diversion it's going to ruin maybe it won't affect us too much in our seafood, because we're in the middle of the Chafalaya River and the Mississippi River. So if they build the diversion on east of us, it won't affect us that much because depending on how much sweet water would come in, fresh water would come in, but it'll harm our oyster, our shrimp, our crabs, and it's already it's already been proven that it kills dolphins. All but they want to deny this because when they opened the spillway, they saw it happen. But they deny it. So the only way it's going to hurt us, we thinking, because we're in the middle, is that it'll bring more fishermen from the east side to our fishing grounds which would hurt because they would wipe us out in a few days. They would wipe out the oysters. They would wipe out, you know, the, uh, the number of crab and the number of shrimp that we have in our area. So, you know, but the water, if we wouldn't have these levees that we have every summer, our yards would be full of water. And it's because of the oil companies. And we think that the oil companies should pay to fill, backfill these canals. But we're searching for money. Now we have a, a meeting with Conical Phillips tomorrow uh, about getting permission, which is land that they stole. We have to get permission from them in order to get a permit to get the canals backfilled when we, if we can find money to do so. So, but, and after Hurricane Ida, you know, I mean, we still have a lot of homeless people. Uh, we still have some that are not back home yet because they can't get in the FEMA trailers. The FEMA trailers are sitting on their properties but they have no electricity yet because FEMA waited so long. We had a lot of linemen here after Ida, but FEMA, I think the first camper came in in November. And a lot of these linemen went home in December. So FEMA was too slow with the trailers to get our people in them. And now they're still slow because People are still not in them because they haven't put them electricity because FEMA hasn't gotten the permits yet. So our community is suffering in so many ways, you know, with um, having more water. Like when Donald and I were first married and I started shrimping with them, the lakes and the bays were all defined. 1992, I had to stop going with him because I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis so I was I became disabled for a while but when I did go back um I told him because I'm I used to drive the boat and I told him I said if you give me the wheel now you know without setting the GPS I'm just gonna go in circles because I had my land markings and all my landmarkings, the land was all gone. So I had no more landmarks. Land is washing away very quickly. 
So, you know, and so we've had to buy a bigger boat in order to be able to go shrimping because in a smaller boat, if there's a little bad weather, you have to come in. You can't shrimp because, you know, it gets too rough because there's no more protection. So these canals have really hurt our community. And I wish they would just realize, you know, the damage that they did and admit it. Just like homes that have to be elevated because of the water coming in. We feel that this should all be the all companies responsibilities because we feel that it's because of them that our community and other coastal communities are washing away. And, you know, we have three different tribes that are are working on these canal the backfill. So hopefully we can get something done and maybe get some attention, you know, the of the politicians. So, um, you know, I'm just, I, and I'm happy to be here to, to talk to you. Teresa, I'm really grateful for your presentation because, um, you know, I think you outlined for us what we as indigenous people know that this, this practice is old, right? It's as old as the arrival of others on our, our earth, our land here. And you're talking, when you, people tend to think about extractive industry as the oil company or as the seaweed company, that which is extracting the resources from the land. What you're describing is the land being taken and the consequences of taking the land. And before you came on, I spoke about my language. In my language family, we have a marker that goes on the end of earth. It's like, you know, earth is a key, a key. And then if it gets the Akim, you're talking about your territory. And the Nadakim is that piece of earth that I'm a part of and is a part of me, without which, without me, it does not exist. And without um, an I, without that earth, don't exist. So it's like that intertwining piece. And so when the earth is dug out, there's a soul wound that happens to the community. And I was wondering, you know, what a lot of times people don't acknowledge what indigenous people are doing from a per place of personal sovereignty and a place of tribal sovereignty. And I was just wondering if, if you could talk about that for a minute, because that, that just struck me about the um, self-determination of your strategy uh, to, to return the stolen land um, to these canals and return the land base to your people. So, yeah. Well, um, we, uh, we put a lawsuit on the oil companies, mm -hmm. but because we're not federally recognized, we're just state recognized. The judge said, well, I'll hold it until you get federal recognition. So, and we're working on federal recognition. We, uh, we, we plan to, uh, you know, resubmit um, soon. So, um, but, you know, this is, this, our people had to move from further down where they were because of land loss. And now we, they come further up and same is happening. But um, so we're, we're struggling, but my husband this morning said, you know, he, I didn't think I'd be able to make the meeting tomorrow because I have another meeting in the afternoon. So they told me, well, it may be just a half hour. So I said, okay, I can make it. But my husband didn't want to go because he said he would probably get upset 
you know, they would probably say something, uh, Conoco Phillips is an oil company, which is down here. Because we, not, not my husband, because he refuses to do it. But his, he has two brothers and we have other community members that have to rent waters to fish crabs from Conoco Phillips. So, you know, so my husband said, no, it, he, all it'll take is something for them to say. And, you know, he would, he would start, you know, but anyway, so I'll go in his place because I could be a little calmer than him. And I bet Marion is thinking, Donald? And yeah, Donald's not quite Donald anymore. But um, anyway. Speaking of, speaking of Marion, she keeps asking me to ask you to talk a little bit about um, the pressure that could be put on the oil companies. And a couple of people want to know which oil companies are responsible for this and how can people, and this is a question for all of the panelists too, how can the people who are on uh, this webinar support your work? What well, you it was, at the time it was Louisiana land, but now I think uh, Conoco Phillips is in our area and also Apache. And I really don't know what kind of pressure we could put on them to help any kind of way because they doesn't they don't claim responsibility for the land loss. So it's like we have to go to each individual uh, all companies or the, the scientists we're working with. I mean, we're the real scientists in our community because we know our community, we know our land. But we have his advice, you know, and he's the one, if you, if they get a letter from the scientist saying, well, this is what, and he's the one that did the first, he knows about the uh, backfilling canals, you know, that were done already. But he's the one that wrote to Conoco Phillips for us because we have a canal meeting every Monday morning. And so anyway, he's writing to all these, uh, to Conoco Phillips and Apache, because Louisiana Land went, uh, changed their name or they sold it. I don't know what they did, but it's now Conoco Phillips. And so Apache and Conoco Phillips, they're in our area. So he has to write letters to them. And Conical Phillips has agreed to meet with us, but I think Apache has not answered yet. So, but that's, that's, I don't really, I don't know what kind of pressure we would be able to put on them to make them, you know, pay to, to refill the canals. We're hoping that if we can get the money that they'll give us permission and I hate that word permission because I feel like we should be able to do whatever we want on our land. But yet we, they claim it. And if you go, like we had, um, we built a living shoreline to uh, protect one of our mounds because it was washing away because of a cut that the all companies did. Well, we had a, an organization that was going to help us, but because we had a lawsuit and that they, uh, Apache or Conoco Phillips, I don't know which one, I don't remember which one, uh, claim it and we claim it. So they, they wouldn't help us because of, because of that. So, you know, that's why we have to look for grants. To, to try and help us because the all companies will not take responsibility where it is their responsibility. Um, Teresa, a couple of people are asking how, uh, and I know this is a really complicated question and it has to do, it, it cuts to the heart of tribal sovereignty, but, um, and perhaps we can't go into this deeply in this forum, but is there, are there ways that the tribe could be supported 
in its petition for federal recognition. I know that the US government had, because I've been involved in these so baroque and so hard to do it. But if there are specific things that um, letters of support or um, expert testimony that would be helpful in your petition for federal recognition, perhaps we could share that information either now or later. Well, um, Judy and I forget what others are help are working with our tribal attorney. Okay. She's uh, she teaches uh, American Indian law at a yeah. uh, university, and we were on a call, and I can't remember who else. I just remember Judy. But, Judy, uh, Judy Shapira. Is it Judy Shapira? I think so. She yeah. lives in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, she's uh, they they helping uh, Patty with with the work that Patty's doing. Yeah, Patty's been doing most of the leg work. And then we have a historian that is uh, helping also. So if there's yeah. any any um, support that Judy or Patty think might be helpful, we can send it out, Grove can send it out to the participants. I'm, I'm on, I know Ricky had a little, her end of her presentation was a little bit about how scientists can connect and support and accompany indigenous people. And I'm wondering if we could give Ricky the, her last three to four minutes and then open up to questions from the, um, the rest. Ricky, okay, do you want thank to? You. Yes, thank you. And I, I do actually have a bunch of ideas to share as well. Um, so we last left with the BP oil disaster and human health effects. I just want to wrap that up because I actually was very concerned that this was not oil and cold and flu, it was chemical illnesses. And um, I returned to the Gulf Coast communities over the next seven years to help people connect the dots between their oil spill exposures and their declining health. Um, but with this growing awareness of the connection between environmental health and human health, people started asking about, well, what about daily exposures from these uh, refineries and other oil and gas activities that are right near us. And um, I was, this led to a collaboration with people in frontline communities in Houston and Mobile. Um, and the goal was to develop an accessible science-based program that community leaders could use to help residents understand this connection between environment and health. And the toxic trespass training um, builds capacity to sustain this long-term work of reducing toxic exposures wherever they are, home, workplace, schools, communities. The do-it-yourself manuals are free and online. So this last story is still evolving and this is the one where the native leadership comes in again. It's about banning toxic dispersants used in oil spill response. The Macaw tribe in Northwest Washington has a right that is federally recognized under the Treaty of 1855 Treaty of Nia Bay to decide whether dispersants are used in their usual and accustomed marine waters. This is something we haven't really talked about yet. It's about this expansion of land, federally recognized land rights into marine waters. So the Macaw tribe has usual and accustomed uh, uh, land waters extending from land out to 200 miles the extent of the United States, the exclusive economic zone boundary. And building on that in British Columbia, the health of people are demanding, also demanding marine rights to the foreshore and seabed as part of their usual and accustomed land. A win for the health sick could set precedent and toughen oil spill regulations, which include dispersant use along the whole West Coast. And finally, in Alaska, Alaska Native peoples in the now industrialized oil and gas corridor along the North Slope um, were the first to pass resolutions to restrict or ban dispersants in their traditional marine waters. An Inupiat woman is a plaintiff in Alert Project's lawsuit against EPA over outdated rules um, governing use. 
In November last year, we won and are now pressing EPA to restrict or ban dispersant use in their updated oil spill response plan that's due out in May, 2023. But before I pass it off, I wanna suggest um, that um, the Menominee were getting really successful with their sustainable forestry program. And the, there was, they were federally unrecognized, okay? And it took them 20 years to get federally recognized again, but they did it both with acts of Congress. Um, and I absolutely think that the, um, the tribes in South Louisiana should not be paying for any of this damage. And um, one way possibly is through um, Corporate Ethics International, which shines, they're out of uh, California and they choose corporations to focus on, to shine the spotlight on. They were first and foremost with the um, uh, divestment campaigns. And I think they could really help with this and I'd be happy to, to send um, contacts and links and stuff. Um, and um, secondly, if the, uh, I think it's not just the, there's several tribes in the Southern Louisiana that have not been recognized. And I think the reason was because they were on oil land, okay? So if all of you together tried to get federally recognized, that might help as well. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna interrupt here because okay. Rick, you're jumping into what is, you know, at the heart of indigeneity and it's, uh, those are internal tribal matters, how tribes decide to move forward with recognition or not. And um, I just wanted to reframe two things. I think what you said has been extremely, extremely helpful. And I feel like everybody needs to be reminded that there's um, a fundamental uh, core of federal Indian law and that is uh, in treaty negotiation, if you haven't given it away, you retain it. And it's called a retained right. And so if you go back to the earlier conversation and Teresa's discussion about the relationship of her people to the land, uh, it's impossible for us to give away the water. It's impossible. We, we couldn't do it. It's not in our language. It's not in our culture. And I, I think this is uh, the, the uh, indigenous people on the Chukchit Sea prevailed in their argument that they had never alienated themselves from the, um, the coastal water uh, that their, their tribe is on. And, uh, but the federal government will try to dodge that and try to look at what's in the treaty instead of acknowledging that if it's not in the treaty, it still exists. So the most coastal people never gave away their relationship with the water that, uh, you know, that they've stood in since time began. It's just, it would be an impossible thought. Um, and the other piece is, and I want to really acknowledge this. Um, I'm, I have two lines. My uh, grandmother's line is from Odenak First Nation in Canada. And my grandfather's line is from the uh, Anabiniki community in Vermont, a remnant community in Vermont. And all of the Abiniki communities in Vermont have been recognized by the state, but not by the federal government. And there's all kinds of political reasons why um, the federal government uh, slows, chooses not to recognize. And I think oil might be one of them, but I know that if we look at the um, lawsuits that are being funded by the conservative think tanks through the Indian Child Welfare Act, the um, the sovereignty of tribal people in our own land is under siege right now, not just because of um, the, the richness that we 
in our relationship with the earth and the water that we try to protect, but because of our very existence. And, um, you know, that we said before, this is an old story. Um, I, it's no accident that they're allowing the forced removal of Teresa's people by erasing their land um, at a time when they are standing up to the practices of the oil company. So I encourage all, uh, all of us just to keep that forefront. And um, so I just think we need to keep the, those, that reality forefront that even if it's not written into a treaty, it is retained and retained rights are strong. And that's part of the um, canons of construction of federal Indian law. So um, I have a note here uh, about how the, um, how funding is denied to indigenous people and uh, and who can receive funds on behalf of Indians. And I think that um, those are all very important lines of conversation, but I would really like to keep this, our, our final 20 minutes here, really focused on the, this critical work that we have to do to um, protect the intertidal zone, which is actually the, it's the, um, cradle of life, not just for the planet, uh, but for the oceans and, um, you know, sorry, <laughs> connecting us to so many things. Um, so I, I just want to, we could go down a whole bunch of different things, um, but let's stay focused on uh, the, the protective work that Teresa's engaged in the accompanying work that uh, Robin and Ricky as renowned scientists are doing to um, accompany indigenous people. And uh, so I wanna go ask um, Robin because she hasn't had a chance to respond to this. What, um, where can people go to support your work here um, in protecting the intertidal zone and keeping extractive mining from you know being born on the rivers like within miles of the shore, uh, I think a mile of the shore, maybe three. Um, so, if we could do that, um. yeah. So uh, the I'm I'm a founding member of the Maine Rockweed Coalition, although I'm here speaking as a scientist, not as a board member of the 501c3, but it is Maine Rockweed Coalition, all one word, dot org. And the group that is working on the silver mine is Friends of Cobscook Bay, all one word, dot org, and I will type that in the chat. Uh, what, what I'm really keenly interested in now are the cases that uh, Ricky mentioned of uh, native peoples extending <clears throat> extending rights into the intertidal and into the marine waters and um, I'd love to know where's a good central place if there is one to learn about that whole effort. Uh, well raventrust.com uh, um, was started to basically support indigenous lawsuits in landmark legislation that that challenges uh, the concepts of ownership. Um, so, and if you go to the campaigns, the campaigns are actually each lot, uh, different tribes, mm -hmm. and you'll see the Heltsuk, uh tribe there, but you'll also see other, there's about seven or eight campaigns ongoing right now, tar sands, everything you can imagine. Um, tag teaming with Jamie, and uh, in some ways, that little baby is such a welcome participant, uh, reminding us all of, of what's real and what's at stake here. Um, I wondered whether, I really appreciate the idea of talking about the protective work and the accompanying work. And I think that we, everyone on this call who's from 
the USA has direct responsibility because we've benefited from these corporations that are doing this um, heinous destructive work as well. And that's one place where we can come together, possibly under an interfaith umbrella or in um, any other ways that we can think of. Um, and I, I just, I wondered, Teresa, one thing I don't think we've heard yet, and I wondered if you'd be willing to speak about, um, I know there's a lot of work protecting the land and it's um, based in a, a heart and a value system. And it's, it's difficult for people to stay, but if you could speak a little more about um, that, that, that work. Okay, well, we've been working with um, CR, CRCL, uh, which is Coastal Restoration of Louisiana. Um, I don't remember, but anyway, uh, we've been working with them. In 2019, we did uh, oyster shell, not official oyster shell reef, which um, we put around the mound that was washing away. So, and after Ida, they came back, my husband took them out on a boat ride to check it out and it did fine. We had no land loss around that mound. The oysters, uh, it was some sacks, 30 pound sacks of oyster shells that were uh, put all around. We used thousands, thousands of uh, bags to put around there. And they held up and they're doing good, and they are, we call it a living shoreline because off of these oyster shells, crabs and fish come and feed off of them, and also oysters. They have little oysters growing on them. So, and we are planning to do another one in another spot in September, and then uh, with our backfilling canals, if we can't find a. Uh, you know, uh, monies, enough monies to do it the way we want to do it. We are planning to do hay bales. Uh -huh. We're going to put hay bales in at the end of the canal to block that current that comes in so strong to wash away the land. And every Monday we, we talk about different ways, maybe, you know, that we can do it you know, um, the if we could find the cheapest hay, you know, the ones that's not the best. And uh, there's, and we try to identify, you know, the places that would need to be done first. And so my husband and another, and a few other fishermen met with a map and they found several spots where uh, we're gonna start working. And if nothing else, my husband makes hay for his horse. And sometimes it's grass that's not that good and she won't eat. So mm -hmm. we can start by using some of his old, uh, mm -hmm. old hay bales to uh, start stopping. We're going to try anything we can to try and stop uh, some of this erosion. Teresa, the word regenerative is one that people are using a lot now as a principle to talk about giving back and replenishing soils for agriculture, et cetera. And it sounds like the practice you're talking about is, is similar of working with the system. Um, I wondered if you could just say for a moment about the accompaniment that you might be having from scientists, um, obviously more financial resources coming in would be helpful. What, what kind of partnerships are assisting in this? Well, we have several, we have a scientist, uh, Jean, uh, Eugene, um, I can't remember, Turner. Uh, he's the scientist from LSU. And then we have a few attorneys that are on board and that looks for grant. And we did get um, a grant that will pay the permits. So that's why we need to get with the all companies 
to get the okay to be able to get the permits. But with hay baling, we found out we don't need a permit. Mm -hmm. we, just net, we just need to let the people know that those hay bales will be at the end of canal, at the end of the canal so that they don't go and harm their boats. You know, we'll put signs saying that they can't pass here anymore. So, you know, there's, and they may have a few of them that'll be upset a uh, while, well, you know, be, once they get to understand that it's to save the land, they'll be okay. Because a lot of people use these canals because it's a shortcut, you know, it washed up enough, big enough to where the boats can go, you know, through. So, and that causes a lot of the erosion as well. The waves, you know, the waves. Um, so the action of the waves. So anyway, so uh, we're gonna have to advise our community and put up signs. So, you know, that we can slow some of this, uh, some of this water coming in. But we did, and then we also, uh, in fact, tomorrow, one, one of the meetings I have is with the Greater New Orleans Foundation. Uh, they gave us a grant for uh, building materials uh, after Ida. So it doesn't have anything to do with the canals, but um, you know, it does have a, a rebuilding. So they coming, because they gave us a grant, they wanna come and interview me, uh, you know, talk about how it was before the storm and then how the people are suffering now. But uh, we have quite a few scientists, uh, you know, that are working with us. And we have a few partners, um, like the, the tribe in, because uh, we have a tribe that's in um, Plaquemines Parish that's also working for, canal, for canals, and she's on the meeting with us every Monday. Well, she's working with CPRA, trying to get them to do some canals because that if they do build that diversion, that diversion is going to probably wash out their community completely because they're a community that you still have to get to your house by boat. Mm -hmm. They park their vehicles. Uh, they have a landing where they park their vehicles and they go by boat to their homes. So, and if this diversion is done, it could wipe them out. So that's why they, they meet, they've been meeting with CPRA to try and get backfilling canals around their area to try to stop some of this uh, erosion. Thank you. It's, it's, it's so painful to hear about the level of, of work that needs to be done. And the fact that you're all doing it is, is uh, wonderful. Uh, there's a question that came in about influencing environmental studies. And it I, sounds like, oh, please, Jamie. I just wanted to leap in um, to, to uh, follow up a little bit and, and to speak about something that I think is, is not often under understood. And it kind of links to the question on environmental studies. Um, I, I think we owe a real debt of gratitude to the scientists who have decided to accompany indigenous people. And I think we need to acknowledge that oftentimes they end up being quite marginalized in their fields because of the positions that they've taken um, in support of traditional wisdom and traditional wisdom keepers. Um, occasionally you do see um, things coming together after many years. And I'll just quickly say here in where I live, um, the tribe has for, for over, as long as anyone can remember, has not been able to drink its own water. And uh, the tribe has struggled to get clean water and been thwarted at every turn. But recently, a partnership has emerged between scientists, the state, 
and the federal government to um, to fix and clean the water. And a, a lot of that came as, as the tribe was able to get uh, scientists and ecologists to demonstrate where the problem lay. What was the scientific basis for the problem? Because without knowing why these carcinogens were in the water and why the water was uh, a, 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 such a horrible color and horrible smell um, was a barrier to fix. So there's, there are possibilities for structural alliances, but they come out of a long uh, diplomatic struggle. And I'm grateful to our elders. And it sounds to me, Teresa, like you're, you're one of the elders that has that traditional diplomatic skill to bring people to you rather than push people away and at this point in time. Well, we, um, we work with uh, LSU Mass Matthew Bethel, which um, he's in uh, environmental uh, studies. And uh, well, he's a professor at LSU. And my husband's been working with him for years. They go out on the boat sometimes for the whole day. And what he does is he, they check the marsh, you know, to see how healthy the marsh is. So grateful that you were able to get on and be with us this morning. You transformed the conversation and grounded it. And um, I'm appreciative, really appreciative. It was good to be here to see all of y'all. Yeah. And uh, Teresa, I do hope that we can stay in touch with you because so many on this call are asking about how to be of accompaniment, how to be of assistance, where pressure can be put. And of course, um, you are the expert in your local setting. And I so admire the way you're also spreading out and working with other communities along the coast. And I've also heard from coastal communities in Texas that are facing really similar problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do, as someone from up in the Boston area, want to express a North-South solidarity um, around these issues. And I think we all have to and in just a very few moments. So uh, Jamie, would you like to suggest that we go to a last comment? Uh, okay, I um, saw the comments about uh, environmental literacy. And so I've given um, my, my favorite teachers to work with or organizations, which is the Green School Network um, and the Cloud Institute for Sustainability Education. There are teachers that are pushing um, uh, these um, ideas that reconnect young people to the land and to the planet, um, to our water, to our earth. Um, and that is so um, important, I think. Um, so that's been very positive. Um, and I think that's where the real legacy lies is getting the youth at an early age to reconnect. And Robin? Uh, the seaweed work brings together so many different peoples and ideas and structures. And I really look forward to increasing the alliances here along the coast to work on this issue much more powerfully than we even have so far. So thank you. And Teresa, I want to give the final words to you. Well, Teresa, yeah. Okay. Uh, it was a pleasure being here. And if I think of a way that we could all put pressure on the all companies and um, the federal, you know, for federal recognition, because I feel that we're the first peoples, we should not be having to prove who we are. We should be recognized automatically. But yet we have to do these seven criteria in order to be recognized. We're the only people that have to prove who we are and mm -hmm. have a number. Yeah. You know, we're like prisoners. You num the prisoners have numbers. You know, so you know it's we need to do away with all all this. 
and just recognize who we are as a people, as, you know, the first peoples of this land. And thank you all. Thank you all. Um, really appreciate everyone's participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks to wonderful speakers. Really appreciate all of you coming and looking forward to working together as we move forward. And thank you to our, all of our audience as well. Really awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for putting this together. <laughs>